Okay, so we're continuing our study of the latter prophets, and today we're going to look at the prophet of Hosea. So if you want to open your Bibles to Hosea, in the English Bible it is um, the first of the minor prophets, so it's right after uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, then Hosea. Of course, Lamentations is stuck in the middle there too. So just a question of review, why do we call them major and minor? I'm glad you said what you said. Apparently, because of the size. Because of the size, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and at least that's what they tell us. It's, it's, they say it's not because one is more important than the other, but it's, it's because of the size. Well, that causes me all kinds of problems because it seems that the minor prophets are any book that is 12 chapters or less. And um, which, of course, doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, because. Um, um, <clears throat> Hosea has 12 chapters and Lamentations only has 5 chapters right so, uh, so and yet Lamentations is considered part of the, the major prophets Hosea has 14 or, or I, Hosea has 14 chapters what, I did write 12 yeah. it's got 14 chapters so it, it's, uh, it doesn't really make sense and of course Daniel only has 12 chapters so it's got less so why is Daniel there and, and, and not Hosea? Um, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, of course, there is another reason for it, for, for why. And I think the, the way the Hebrew Bible sets it up is probably the correct way and, and makes a whole lot more sense. And I'm not going to go into all of that aspect of it. So um, we have then, in, in the terms of the prophets, God sent prophets to Israel and to Judah. And uh, these initial prophets were, were warning prophets. They were prophets who were calling the people back to covenant faithfulness. They're saying, you guys, you're, you're sinning. You need to, to return back to God because if you don't, then, then God's going to have to punish you. Uh, for breaking the covenant. But their main message was about, about uh, returning to covenant faithfulness. And of course, God also used them to help give kings direction. Should we go into battle? Well, we talk to God's prophet, find out whether God wants us to go or not. That kind of thing. The second kind of prophet that is sent is what are the prophets we call the writing prophets. These are the prosecuting lawyers. So God has uh, opened up the courts and has uh, found uh, Judah and Israel to be guilty of violations to the covenant. Um, and uh, they've been found guilty. And having been found guilty is now pronouncing his judgment. So he sent these prophets, uh, the writing prophets, to pronounce the judgment of God on these nations. And so there they, you read all about the, what they've done, the accusation. You read now then... This is what your future is going to look like. This is the judgment that's coming upon you. Basically, it's destruction all the way. And, but then there's an element of hope, okay? a hope of restoration. And Hosea, we're going to discover, actually is the first of the writing prophets who brings out this aspect of hope or of restoration um, um, and lays the foundation for that. So if you look at our chart, that we are following, uh, we have done Jonah, we've done Amos, and uh, now we are on Hosea. We're going to finish all of Hosea today. So, if you have your Bibles open, the first verse of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us there that Hosea is a prophet during the reigns of four kings of Judah, and the king Jeroboam II of Israel. Now, the, the significance of this is that, that uh, it means that Hosea is alive at the time Assyria attacks and destroys the northern city. So in 722, if you have your chart, you can see that on there. He's alive during that period of time. Um, and um, we don't know if Hosea was actually from Israel, but it's clear from his writings that he must have lived in Israel <laughs> somewhere, uh, at least during the time of his ministry, because that's... The bulk of his ministry is to those people. And it would be through the king uh, uh, and the mostly. So now, if he lived during the reigns of four kings of Judah, 
then he also lived through the reigns of the seven last kings of Israel. But they're not mentioned there. And uh, the obvious, it's quite obvious that they're not mentioned there. Um, but um, <clears throat> probably because they were totally insignificant. In fact, if you, you took their combined years of being kings, it only covers 20 years. <coughs> so which is not very much time in concerns of the reign, concerning the reign of a king. And if you look in the books of uh, Second Kings and the book of Second Chronicles, uh, you discover that they only cover three chapters in Second Kings, from Second Kings 14 to 17, um, and they're not mentioned at all in Second Chronicles. So they're they're really insignificant. That's probably why he's not there. And uh, Jeroboam, of course, was the last significant king of Israel. So the book of Hosea divides into two parts. So you, we're going to follow this chart uh, in our study today. Uh, chapters 1 to 3 form the first part. Chapters 14 to 4 to 14 form the second part. Now, chapters 1 to 3, just to give you a, an, an overview, <clears throat> in chapters 1 to 3, we have the marriage of Hosea and Gomer. And God is using his marriage as an illustration, a real-life illustration, of the relationship between God and Israel. So in this real-life illustration, Hosea is a type of God, and Gomer is a type of Israel. Their marriage then is, marriage then is symbolic of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. And of course, uh, as we read it through, uh, Gomer becomes, and, and I think this is important, sometimes we, we, um, we have been presented with the idea that Hosea married a prostitute. I don't think he did. I think the wording is clear enough, and since the instruction comes from God, and God would not tell him to do something which is, violates the covenant law itself, um, she became a prostitute later. So Hosea and, and, uh, and Gomer get married, and they're having a good relationship. Same as when, when God called Israel and gave them the covenant in Exodus 20 uh, and, and, and on. That they had a good relationship, but then they went off to foreign idols, just as Gomer went off to become a prostitute. And I believe that she became a prostitute in one of the temples that was built probably for the God Baal. And Israel is unfaithful to God, breaking the covenant relationship, joining into the worship of these gods in the same way that Gomer um, went off and became unfaithful to her husband. So Hosea, it tells us in these chapters that Hosea decides that, that to win her back, he's going to punish her. And, and in giving her, punishing her, and depriving her of things, that she will realize that life is better with Hosea than not with him. And uh, so she should <clears throat> repent and return to him. But she doesn't. She doesn't return uh, to her husband. In, in the same way, uh, God warns Israel that he's going to punish them. And in the warning of, of, of these, this uh, um, <coughs> judgment that's going to come upon them, uh, in the hopes that they would repent, but they do not repent either. We've, eventually, Hosea tells us in chapter 3, Hosea buys Gomer's freedom uh, from the temple service. Hosea is to love her as though she had never sinned against him, and Gomer is to belong to him only. So God also is going to redeem Israel, and they will become his people forever. What immediately comes to your mind when you hear that? What's the picture? It's Jesus, isn't it? And this is actually one of the first inferences of Jesus and the cross in the book of Hosea. We're actually going to discover that there are six. Uh, it, it was really interesting. All right, chapters uh, 4 to 14 <clears throat> I form the second part of the book. And in those chapters, Hosea highlights the unfaithfulness of Israel as illustrated in the unfaithfulness of, <clears throat> of Gomer. So in both books, we have these cycles. So they, they go from, uh, they talk about the judgment, then they talk about the restoration, then they go repeat it again and talk about the judgment, and then talk about the restoration. 
So you have to understand that this is the style and format. We looked at that last week as uh, the way that the prophets work. They, they, they kept repeating things over and over just from a different angle. All right, so in, in, in uh, part one, we actually have three cycles, and the, the, uh, the texts are written there. And in part two, we have four cycles. So for a uh, <clears throat> total of seven cycles. So let's, let's begin by looking at the first cycle in uh, chapters one, two to, to two, one. So here, again, the, their judgment is being symbolized uh, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 9, or verse 2 to 9. So within the, within the dynamics, again, of Hosea and Gomer's marriage relationship, there is this second element which forms this, this uh, illustration about God's judgment on Israel, and that is in the, uh, the names of the children of Hosea and Gomer. So it tells us that they have a son, then they have a daughter, then they have another son. The first son is named Jezreel. Now Jezreel is the name of a plain uh, that's a little north of where they are. And uh, it's a plain that has history to it. And you can read about it in, in the Second Kings. Um, but it's the place where Jehu, one of the kings of Israel, killed the dynasty of Ahab. Okay, you all remember Ahab and the prophets of Baal and Jezebel and and all that, okay, well, God told Jehu to wipe out his dynasty, but Jehu went a little overboard and killed not only his children, but his, his priests, his officers of the court, uh, everything, that anybody that was involved with him, and it became a place of massacre. And, uh, and by naming, Hosea naming his first son Jezreel, they, is giving us the indication here or a sign that God is going to destroy all of the kings of Israel in the same manner. He's going to wipe them out. The daughter is named Lo Ruhama. Now, I think it's, it's unfortunate that our English Bibles didn't put it that way. Um, but it should, be, it should have been put in that way. That was her name. And her name means no mercy. The word Lo means no or not. And so it's no mercy. The, uh, <clears throat> and the last son was named Lo-Ami, which means not my people. Okay, so Ruhama means mercy or compassion. Ami means not my people, or means my people. And when you stick the Lo in front of it, it's no mercy, no compassion, and not my people. You see, and, and what is happening here is this is God's <coughs> judgment on Israel. And uh, they are no longer, God is saying, you are no longer my people. He will show them no mercy when he punishes them on the battlefield. And this is exactly what ended up happening. Okay? And of course, Paul refers to this text in Romans 9 when he confirms that God's promises concerning Israel have not failed because for the simple fact that the promises given to Abraham are for the remnant of Israel, those that come to believe in Christ. It is not for anybody else other than those that believe in Jesus Christ. It's not for national Israel. Uh, and as as uh, the King James puts it, not all Israel is Israel. Uh, Amos introduced us to this concept, even though the, uh, the promise to Abraham is that the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea. We see that in 110. Uh, God has rejected the northern tribes of Israel. God says in 1.4, I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Okay, so the, this is the application. Again, the house of Israel is a concept that Amos brought out. Um, and it's, it's talking about the house of David. <clears throat> it's the contrast to the house of David. So again, the two kingdoms, which Amos said would eventually be restored. So God has chosen who would receive the promises that were given to Abraham. Now, I, 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 I'm going to take a little bit of an aside here because I think this is really important because we, we have heard so much teaching that has confused us that we don't get this right. But uh, this whole selection, so what we read in Romans 9 in our scripture reading, uh, we all know that out of Ishmael and Isaac, God rejected Ishmael and chose Isaac. We all know that one. We find that one easy. 
but we miss a whole bunch of the others. So I'm going to demonstrate it here for you. And I know this is small, but it's because this, this, it's going to go right across. So God gives the promises to Abraham that, uh, that one of his offspring would be bring a blessing to all of the nations. So he has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And God rejects Ishmael and chooses Isaac. From Isaac then, he has two sons, which are Esau and Jacob. And God rejects Esau and chooses Jacob. Okay, you got to remember again, Ishmael is a son of Abraham. Uh, Esau is a grandson of Abraham. They are physically connected to him, but they're rejected by God and all of their offspring. So we now have Jacob, and Jacob has uh, uh, 12 sons, and they end up in Egypt in captivity eventually, and God has to de deliver them. So God delivers a generation out of Egypt, but they don't believe. So he makes them wander in the wilderness until they have been wiped out, and he chooses the second generation. So we have first and a second generation that come out of Egypt, the first generation is rejected. All of them rejected. And Hebrews chapter 3 talks about this generation, that they were rejected by God. They did not receive the promise because they did not have faith. <clears throat> this generation then, of course, uh, uh, eventually uh, has kings and then it divides into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Judah and Israel. And Hosea is telling us that God rejects Israel. They're no longer his people. But he still has chosen Judah. Judah then, of course, uh, ends up in Babylon in captivity. And, and uh, we have in captivity in Babylon, we have, they are called exiles. And while they're in exiles, then God because of what Hosea is going to say later about the restoration, he's going to restore the nation. Um, there is some people that, that return under the decree of Cyrus, and they return to the land to rebuild it. So we have exiles and the remnant. The exiles that remain are rejected by God. They're no longer his people. And the remnant he has chosen. From that remnant, remnant, they rebuild the, the city, they rebuild the temple, but it's nothing like the Temple of Solomon. And they realize that this is not what the prophets talked about. That there was a coming another temple that was going to be more glorious. And, 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 uh, and it's not until Jesus Christ comes that they realize that Jesus is the true temple. And so we have at the time of Christ, at the cross, we have the Jews that were living in the land, and we have Jesus and Romans 9 tells us he rejected the Jews. But not all the Jews. He chose the Jews that believe in Jesus Christ. And, and, and so we, we have here now the whole thing from Abraham to Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 tells us uh, emphatically the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring who is Christ. So all the ones in between were just a stepping stone to get to Christ. So Abraham to Jesus, that's the most important thing. Everything else is a type or a, uh, or a symbol or a stepping stone to get to Jesus Christ. And remember we saw that at the golden calf incident. What did God say? He said, I'm going to wipe them out. But I'm not going to do it in this generation because I've got to build generations to get to Christ. And it's at that generation that I'm going to destroy them, which he did in 70 AD. You see? And everybody, he says in Galatians uh, 3.29, and if you are Christ, <coughs> then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to promise. <clears throat> everybody afterwards is not a national Jew, but is a Jew by faith, in that they are connected to Abraham. And they are um, believers and believers only. So I, I hope that, that helps settle some things in your, <clears throat> in your mind. So the Old Testament nation of Israel were the people of God in the same sense that the Philistines were the people of Dagon. All right? It's a sacral society in, in, which, um, in, in, in which every nation had a God uh, with a small g and, and Israel had a God with a capital G. Except that Israel ended up 
this northern tribe of Israel ended up with multiple gods, and their favorite god was not Yahweh, but was in fact Baal. And that's the one they followed. All right, so Jonah showed us that there was coming a new grace, a new redeeming grace. It wasn't a common grace that covered all people, but it was a redeeming grace for individuals, where individuals were saved by the life of another. Hosea is reinforcing that here. So let's take a look at this first chapter, this first section on the restoration. So if you have your Bibles, look at verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. In, in verse 10, through to 2, 1, we have this promise of restoration. Verse 10, and in the place where it is said of them, that is said of Israel, you are not my people. Okay, and that's an important thing, remember that. Well, every time people read that, especially when they read it in Romans 9, they think they're talking about Gentiles. It's not Gentiles. It's these this Jewish northern tribes that it's talking about. They are not God's people. Right? So you got to understand that. You are not my people. And it shall be said to them, children of the living God. You're not my people. But guess what? Some of you will become children of the living God. That's what he's saying. There's the promise. <coughs> Verse 11. And the children of Judah. Okay, so now he's going to say something about Judah, which we know now is really the ones that he chose. And the children of Israel shall be gathered together. So these one that God will choose are going to join with the children of Judah that he has chosen to become his people. And we know that happens at the time of Christ. So the children of Judah and Israel are the future remnant whom God will save. And God will unite the nation once again under one king. So he says in verse 11, Great shall be the day of Jezreel. So what he's saying there is that there's going to be a lot of loss in that day of destruction. But God is going to preserve a remnant. It's not all loss. It's not the end of the story. The name of Jezreel will no longer apply. But they will be called Ami and Ruhama, God's people and compassion. Because God is going to show his compassion on them. How does God show his compassion? John 3, 16. God loved the world that he gave his son. Okay, so Jews who believe in Jesus. All right, so we go now to the second section on the judgment. So he's going to revert back. So in this text, in 2, 2 to 15, Hosea uses his relationship with Gomer to highlight how God's going to actually deal with Israel. In verse 11, God says, I will put an end to all that defines Israel, and God will punish <coughs> Israel as an unfaithful wife. So now we come to the second passage on restoration, verses 16 to 23. Okay, here we find that God says he will give them a new name. Sound familiar? A new covenant, verse 18. They're going to be married to God forever. Verse 19. And when they are married, there will be righteousness, justice, and mercy. There's going to be no more sin. What is this a description of? Sounds like a description of the kingdom of God, doesn't it? Remember our study in Romans that we just did? Romans 14.7. Uh, Paul says that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And who are the members of the kingdom of God? Only those who believe. You see. So we're, we're starting to see the, this total connection. Um, <clears throat> these are all, of course, New Testament concepts applied to the cross. And in this restoration, all will know the Lord. This is an absolute key phrase, verse 20. All will know the Lord, because this is quoted by Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 31, 34, and again in the New Testament, in Hebrews 8, as the distinguishing mark of what we call the church, of the ecclesia, of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is made up of those who know the Lord, only those who are saved. That's why we know that when Jeremiah said that I will make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah, that he's not <coughs> talking about national Israel and national Judah. Because it has to be Jews who are know the Lord salvifically, who have been saved, who come to faith in Christ. All right, let's uh, let's move on to the the the, um, 
chapter three. Chapter three is a really cool chapter. In fact, it's one of the greatest chapters in the book. Chapter three begins with a picture of redemption. See if you can see it here. Hosea is told to buy his wife from the temple and then to love her. In verse 4, we have another statement about their judgment, which says that they are going to have no king, no temple, no priest, no idols. Of course, losing those things is not a big deal. In fact, it's a good thing that they lose those things because they have no king that's good. They're all bad. They have no temple to Yahweh. Now, all the temples they have are to Baal or to other gods. Um, they have no godly priests, priests that are leading them in the worship of God. And they have lots and lots and lots of idols. So this is a good thing that God's going to wipe them out this way. But it's this statement of redemption that is important. We're going to come back to that. Let's first look at verse 5. Because verse 5 is the statement of restoration. Um, it says, <coughs> afterward, so after he destroys them, the children of Israel will return. The, they will seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Okay, a lot of things in that verse. So Hosea, of course, is building now on what Amos said in 9-11, when he talked about building the household or the booth of David, <clears throat> which connects us to 2 Samuel 7, when, God said to, when David said to God, I'm going to build you a house, and God said, no, I'm going to build you a house, except that it wasn't a physical house he's talking about, he's talking about building him a dynasty, so that his offspring becomes the king, and all those who are part of him are the dynasty that, that he built. It's not a literal kingdom that is, that is being built. It's literal in the sense, sorry, I'm going to make, say this wrong, because if I say it's not a physical kingdom. Do not get confused. The opposite of physical is not literal. Right? The opposite of physical is spiritual. <coughs> Right? So <clears throat> don't let me confuse you there. Uh, and Acts 15, of course, uh, confirms this, which tells us that, that the whole reason why the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised under the Old Covenant is because they're not under the Old Covenant, they're under the New Covenant, and they are the new people of God. And Hosea is confirming this. And uh, Acts 2, David on the day of Pentecost, he quotes... <laughs> Uh, the whole section from the Second Samuel about David, that David is dead, and uh, he still remains in his grave to this day, but the resurrection of Jesus uh, and sitting at the right hand of God is when he took the throne of David. So we have here in verse 3 a <coughs> clear, uh, when we go to the New Testament and come back, we have a very clear picture of, uh, prophetic text that confirms that the nation will be restored under the Christ, the offspring of, the, of David, and that all is confirmed in the New Testament. So there, there's a, the, a reference to Jesus. So Hosea is also saying that this restoration, when they return to God, through the Christ who is, who is given this dynasty, a kingdom and a throne, is going to happen in the last days. And again, we've, been, we've read so much from people that said the last days is still future to us. Well, that's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches that the last days started when Jesus came. And we've been in the last days now ever since. Um, <clears throat> he got this phrase, of course, from Moses in Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. So I want you to look at this because it, it establishes that very fact. In Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verse 30, but uh, let's just back up to verse 25, Deuteronomy 4, 25. When, you're f when you, so Moses is talking to this generation that hasn't gone in to conquer the land yet, so Joshua is going to take them in, so it's before they go in. He says, when you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. There's that legal picture. That you will soon <laughs> utterly perish from the land that you are going over Jordan to possess. <clears throat> you will not live long in it, <clears throat> but will be utterly destroyed. 
and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone and the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay, so, so Moses is telling you, you're going to go in the land, you're going to become an unfaithful wife and uh, commit adultery, idolatry, and, uh, and God's going to punish you and destroy you, but it's, you're going to then seek him and you'll find him. Verse 30, when you are in tribulation and all this comes upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is merciful, and he will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your, your fathers that he swore to them. And, and so he is talking about this days of restoration when the people come back and, and they, are, they are restored and they are restored under Christ. These are the last days. So the New Testament is right. And Hosea indicates that the last days then start with the <clears throat> coming of David's offspring of Christ, which is of course confirmed in Hebrews 1 verse 1 and 2. We spoke spoke to you in the past through the prophets now I speak to you in the latter days through Jesus Christ my son all right so now uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to the next part I'm going to go through fairly quickly so bear with me here before we leave this section I got to point out to you that in the narrative of Hope, Hosea and Gomer his wife we have another clear picture of Christ so look at chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 God instructs Hosea to pay the redemption price to buy his wife from the temple service. She's become a prostitute, probably in the temple of Baal, and she's stuck there. The only way she can get out is if Hosea pays for her salvation, for her redemption from it. <clears throat> and he is then instructed to bring her to his home and she is told to never play the role of an unfaithful wife ever again because she belongs only to him. Now verse 3 becomes a variation of the covenant formula. You all know the covenant formula? I will be your God and you will be my people. Okay, here it is. First, but it's in a kind of a negative way. He says, you shall not play the whore or belong to another man, which is a negative way of saying you belong to me and then he ends with, and I belong to you. So again, bringing in this new covenant picture, new covenant that is created. God, re Hosea redeems her by a payment price, a redemption price. And brings her into his home. Makes him, and, and you'll notice there that he doesn't say he redeems his wife. He says, Mar marry another woman. Because she becomes new. All right, redeeming her from the realm of sin by paying a redemption price is obviously a picture of Jesus, and we know that, again, because of the New Testament. And, and why is this important? It's important because we, we know then that the source of the restoration that Hosea is talking about um, is, in fact, the cross of Christ. It's about re redemption. This is how he's going to restore them, <laughs> through redemption, uh, by paying the price for their salvation so it is a spiritual restoration that, uh, that is really going to happen. So in verse 5, when he talks about after, in the, day, in the latter days, we know that it is after the cross, when the Christ becomes the king, there is a physical restoration, but there is also a spiritual restoration. Okay, <clears throat> so that brings us to the end of, of part 1. Part 2, then, is chapters 4 to 14, and it has uh, four... Uh, of these cycles of between judgment and restoration, uh, as we saw in Amos. All right, let's look at the first one in chapter 4, verse 1, 4, 1 to 5, 15. So it's a little bigger of a section. I'm just going to highlight it. So in this section, God accuses Israel of unfaithfulness, and he says there that in verse 9, 5, Israel will become a desolation in the day of judgment. So I highlight that because this word desolation, which all of the prophets eventually are going to use. Uh, <clears throat> so we come to the next section, the section then on restoration. The first one is chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And here we have 
Most of the time, it's God that's doing the speaking. But in this section, in these three verses, this is Hosea speaking. He has seen this horrible picture, this image, this vision of the destruction of the people. And they're utterly desolated on this day of punishment. And now he talks and he pleads to Israel to, in verse 1, it says, to return to the Lord that God may heal us and bind us up. He's pleading for them to repent to God. And, and this, this word to bind means to put on bandages, to bandage up our sores. It's the imagery of binding wounds, which is used in the Bible in all kinds of places to symbolize God's healing and restorative power. Verse 2 becomes very interesting verse because it is the only place in the Old Testament with a specific reference to being raised on the third day. You see it there? In verse 2, it's the only place in the whole Old Testament that talks, says anything about being raised on the third, third day. <clears throat> now, clearly this is talking about the healing of the nation, bringing it back to life in its context. That is the context. Okay? But we can't miss can't dismiss the wording of how it refers to the resurrection of Christ. In fact, Jesus does the very same thing. Because in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus is walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, he said to them, the scriptures, in the scriptures, it is written that the Christ should suffer and be raised on the third day from the dead. The only place in the Old Testament that does that is, is here in Hosea. This is the text that Jesus is referring to. And he says it is talking about him. So now, so now we've had three references to Jesus in the book of Hosea. All right, the next section of judgment is verses 4 to 10. Again, he clearly talks about them being unfaithful, that they're going to encounter robbers and murderers who lie in wait for them. The next restoration section, beginning at chapter 11, or verse 11, goes down to 7a. Now, again, it's only two verses and half of one, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's one of these verses that is really, really hard to translate. And, and uh, the problem with this comes, where do you put the period? Okay, is the period at the end of verse 11, or is the period at the end of the first half of, of chapter 7, verse 1? It, to me, it makes more sense that, that it's the latter. Uh, whichever way you take it, though, it doesn't change the message. But, but it includes then, because verse 11 talks about Judah, a harvest for Judah, and chapter 7, 1 says, and the same for Israel. And that's why I think that they have to go together. So... <clears throat> So verse 11 becomes this bold statement that a harvest is appointed when I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel. Of course, in the beginning part he's saying to Judah. So Judah is mentioned first, and I think the reason Judah is mentioned first is because it's an indication again that, that of the timing, that it's not, not after Israel is destroyed and before um, Judah goes into exile, but after Judah is exiled and is returns to the Lord. So again, it's beginning to focus down to the time of Christ. So keep in mind that Hosea comes right after Amos as well. And, and the last thing that Amos said in chapter 9, 13, is that there's coming a day of continuous harvest. Remember he said the plowers will overtake the, the harvesters? It's because they're still harvesting. Okay, and Paul applies that very verse in Romans 1.13 to the gospel going out to, to, uh, to people. That that's the harvest that, that Hosea and Amos are talking about. Okay, so again, that brings it specifically to the time of Christ and the, and the proclamation of the gospel. Alright, the next section of judgment is in uh, chap chapter 7 through to 11. And the thing that stands out in this section is that that uh, the prophet says that they shall return to Egypt, right? And um, <clears throat> we see that in 8.13 and in chapter 9, verse 3. Now, if you recall, Amos introduced this concept of, of uh, Egypt and the exodus, uh, that it is it's talking about a second exodus, which is to come, but <coughs> Egypt becomes a symbol 
uh, metaphor for being in in uh, uh, in captivity. So here in Hosea, in Hosea uh, to return to Egypt is actually a reference to Deuteronomy chapter eight verse twenty or chapter twenty eight verse sixty eight. So if you remember, Deuteronomy twenty eight is one of the key texts. Because it's the text that tells us about the blessings if you obey, the curses if you disobey. The very last curse is verse 68. And in verse 68 it says, says if you disobey, then I am going to return you to Egypt. So remember, this is Moses talking to them after they just were delivered out of Egypt. It's this second generation. He said, you disobey, I'm going to return you to Egypt. And this is what Hosea is referring to. So, and, but he's not talking literally Egypt. He's talking about, I'm going to return you to captivity in a foreign land. Uh, <clears throat> and we know it's not literal because in 9 verse 3 says, They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. So it's saying it there. And they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. So in Hebrew pa parallelism, the parallel to Egypt is Assyria. So they're actually going to go to Assyria. They're going to be in captivity like when they were in Egypt, but it's going to be in the land of Assyria. So now we know that this enemy nation that's going to come on them is definitely Assyria. And it's going to happen within 34 years, well actually within 20 years. Okay. So now jump ahead to 11, 5, 11 verse 5. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king. So they're going to be slaves in Assyria. In this section in chapter 11 now, we have another reference to Jesus. So i got to point this one out, even though it's in the judgment section. Just look at verse 1, chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So God is talking about the, the context of the historical events. So he's looking back to when they were in, in Egypt for 400 years, being <laughs> slaves in Egypt, and God called them out. Okay, Moses went and said, said, let my people go. And he brought them out okay, through the Red Sea, um, to the, uh, through the wanderings in the desert, to the, to the land of promise. Okay? So in context, then what's God talking about? That happened 700 years before. And he said that Israel is my son. Okay? Which again is that relationship, this, that sacral relationship of Yahweh to Israel. They were his son. But verse 2, look at this. Verse 2 states that he rebelled and they followed idols, which is what they did. Matthew, now talking about the birth of Christ, quotes this verse, Hosea 11.1, 1, and applies it to Jesus in Matthew 2.15. When Joseph and Mary <laughs> fled to Egypt to avoid the massacre of, by King Herod in Bethlehem, they stayed there until Herod was dead, and then God called them out of Egypt to return to Nazareth. He called his son, Jesus, out of Egypt to go and begin his ministry uh, from Nazareth. And he's quoting that, applied that verse here in Hosea, which is specifically in context talking about the historical event, but is underlying is a reference to Jesus. And again, what, what, why is that? So the, the New Testament wants us to see that this is, is, is a part of Hosea, this underlying message of Jesus Christ, that God sent his son to deliver the remnant of Israel from the slavery to their sin. It's all about Jesus. He is the underlying focus here that we don't see if all we have is the Old Testament. But we need the New Testament and it helps us to see these things very clearly. God has to punish them because of their unfaithfulness, but he has great compassion for the remnant, and he's going to save them through his true son that he calls out of Egypt. All right, let's go to the next restoration, uh, the, um, the restoration text in verses 8 to 11. God, this one is really quick. God says that he cannot give up on the remnant, so he's going to roar like a lion and rescue them from Egypt, from their captivity, and from Assyria, and they will return to their homeland. And <clears throat> Amos, of course, used the same Im Im imagery of God being a lion who roars, if you remember that. All right? and the only thing that from this is there's actually no record anywhere in the Bible 
that talks about them, the children of Israel, the northern tribes, returning to their homeland. Not at all. Because they actually were rejected by God until Jesus came. Then Jews in that northern tribe throughout Samaria are saved. All right. Uh, the, the next section on Judgment 11, uh, 12 to 13. Uh, this is the same as the others. Let's go to the, the chapter 14, verses 4 to 8 is the next section on restoration. And this is where the book ends. Chapter 14, though, begins with a little bit of a commentary by Hosea. So he's speaking again in verse 1. And again, he, he's seen all of this judgment, these horrible visions in his, in his head, and he has warned all the people. Uh, he saw all this desolation on all of this death, and once again, he pleads with them to repent and turn to the Lord. And he tells them, he says, Assyria is not going to be the solution. Okay? God is using them to wipe you out. Okay? And it's not the solution. The solution is in his last line, which is an appeal to God, where he says to God, in you, God, the orphan finds mercy. That's where our solution is for everything. For you and I, in order for us to have salvation, in order for us to be forgiven of our sins, in order for us to have hope for the future, we need to go to God because it is only in Him that He has mercy for the orphans. Okay, so Hosea ends his book here, though, with a promise from God. God says in verse 4 that He will heal their apostasy. Now, this is interesting because earlier in chapter 6, verse 1, God said that he was going to heal their wounds, okay? and which is implying a physical restoration, a physical healing, um, a healing of their land, of their kingdom, and, and all that kind of stuff. But here it is, he's going to heal their apostasy. What's apostasy again? It sins against the, the, uh, the covenant. Okay, so you have a, a law and a covenant. If you break the law, you've apostatized. Okay, in the New Testament, we always we use the word sin, but in the Old Testament, you didn't sin against the covenant. You were an, you were apostatized against it. It was an apostasy. So um, God's going to forgive their sins. In other words, this is what He's saying: that God's going to forgive your sins. First and foremost, again, this restoration is a spiritual restoration. And, uh, and, and so he ties this back again to chapter 2, verse 19, when he talks about the new covenant, where he says, God will betroth them in righteousness and in justice and in faithfulness and in mercy. And it's the new covenant that, that where they find forgiveness of their sins. Okay? So Peter then takes this thought, this, this section, and um, in 1 Peter 2, 24, he applies it now to Jesus by saying, He himself, referring to Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds we have been healed. He's making the application here. How do you have your sins healed? Because Jesus died in your place. It's the picture of the redemption of Jesus dying in their place. Now Isaiah is going to confirm this when we get there. Chapter 53. Um, so we have another reference there to Jesus. So that's the fifth reference in the book of Hosea. Now look at verse 4. This is the... <coughs> sorry, that was the fifth reference. Did I say fourth or did I say fifth? Okay, here was the fifth. We have another reference to Jesus in verse 4. You're going to go, what? Where is that? Okay, look at the verse. I will love them freely... For my anger has turned from them. What turns God's anger from sinners? Propitiation. Propitiation. Romans <coughs> chapter 3. Jesus becomes the propitiation. He satisfies God that the payment is made such that God turns his anger anger his wrath from them and is freely able to love them 
Isn't that what that verse is? I will freely love, love them freely, and for my anger has been turned. It's the picture of propitiation. Through the death of Jesus, we are able to come to God because his anger has been removed. And his anger has been removed because the price has been paid in verse 3. And in the Old Testament, this is actually the language of the scapegoat on the day of, of, uh, of um, atonement. Okay, the, the, you have two goats, the scapegoat, they lay the sins on the scapegoat, and then they send them out into the wilderness to die. And, and um, <clears throat> they take the anger of God, the scapegoat takes the anger of God away. So again, the New Testament makes it clear that this is only carried on through the cross, uh, and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that makes six references to Jesus in the book of Hosea. So in verses 5 to 7, God describes the restoration now of the land. So he, he is going to talk physically here, but he is he really only talking physically? Maybe, maybe not. In verse 8, God declares that he alone is going to look after them. So in this description... Uh, in verses 5 to 7, if you, when you, if you read it, you go, hey, that sounds an awful like uh, Revelation 22 in describing the new heaven and the new earth. And it's also part of Isaiah's description of, in chapter 66 of Isaiah of the new heaven and the new earth, interestingly enough. Okay, so the underlying message of Hosea is that it is Jesus Christ who restores and redeems Israel. All right, summary. What do we, how can we conclude this here? Well, let's go back to Jonah. So we looked at Jonah, and in Jonah we were introduced to this concept of new grace that is coming, um, a grace that is redeeming rather than common, um, that it is saves individuals through the life of another, excuse me, uh, and this results in a new society. All societies were sacral, is that everybody believed the same thing. Every nation had one God, and every person in that nation belonged and believed in that one God, was loyal to that God, and loyal to the king. It says, now it's going to be different, because not everybody is going to believe in God. There's going to be believers and unbelievers in this new society. And, and uh, it, we will now have choices in what we can and cannot believe. Nobody can tell us. And then Jonah also shows us, shows Israel in particular, that if God can show compassion to their enemies, then he can also show compassion to them. Amos now tells us that there is this day of punishment that's coming that will utterly destroy the nation, but there will also be a remnant who, through the offspring of David, is going to be restored um, and is described as an ongoing harvest leading to an eternal inheritance. So Amos also introduces the concepts of the day, that day, the day of the Lord, as well as a righteous remnant and a second exodus. Hosea then introduces the concept again of the restoration of Israel um, after it's destroyed by the Assyrians, in which they return to the land, which is described as being Eden-like. Hosea seems to indicate that the restoration happens at the time of Christ, in the first century and not beyond. So that's the books of Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. Okay, that was a whirlwind, pun intended, uh, <coughs> go through. Y'all got that right? Mm -hmm. Chapter 8, Israel is going to bring, reap the whirlwind. Okay. Uh, the thing that jumps out at me, and it's going to get explained in Isaiah, again, is how God is saying that there's a remnant He's going to restore Israel, but He never does. He never physically restores them. So it, 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 you have to think about that. There is not a physical restoration to this northern tribes, but it is purely and solely a spiritual restoration through the underlying passages of Jesus out of there. All right, Declan, you want to get the camera, and we'll end. So next, next time we're going to start... Um, with the book of Isaiah, we're, we're not doing that in one message, right? And, and at this point, I don't know how many messages it's going to take. In fact, I got butterflies in my stomach as I think about how. What am I going to do? How am I going to 
be even be ready for the first one. So pray for me this week. I might have to stick something in between while I get, even get ready for it. All right, thank you. Okay.